If you're a front-end engineer who uses React and you also like video games, I think I might have something you're gonna enjoy. Hey, I'm Brie, and I'm so happy to present and bring to YouTube a talk that I recently gave at that conference in Wisconsin Dells. This is a talk all about React hooks, how to use them, when you should use them, and we're also gonna talk about dynamic content loading, all with a little sprinkle of video game magic. Before I dive in, I just wanna cover a couple of housekeeping things. The first one is the GitHub repo that has all of my samples and all of my notes is gonna be posted in the description. And the second thing is, this was actually the very first talk that I gave at a conference, so I can already see quite a few things that I would want to change and tweak with the talk, and this is really just the first version of it, but I'm so excited to, um, to bring it to YouTube. So without further ado, let's jump into the quest of mastery, front-end techniques in the realm of Hyrule with React. Hey, I'm Bree, and in case we haven't met before, I am a front-end software engineer turned developer advocate at HubSpot. I moonlight as a technical content creator on TikTok and Instagram, typically, but I also do have a channel here on YouTube. And my main goal is to show people that there's not one right way to become or to be an engineer. So when I'm not arms deep in code, you can typically find me doing things like reading, baking, playing board games, and as you can probably guess, playing video games. And my favorite video game series just happens to be The Legend of Zelda, which was the inspiration for this talk. So if you all play video games or you like Zelda, tell me in the comments below what your favorite Zelda game is. There are no wrong answers unless your favorite Zelda game happens to be one of these monstrosities. I'm just kidding, obviously, we can still be friends. So what do Zelda games or video games in general really have to do with React? At the surface level, it may not seem like a lot, but I hope by the end of our time together, you'll start to see some parallels. So here's the thing. As developers, we are constantly learning. And I will be the first person to say that there are a wide variety of computer science topics or just coding topics that I did not get or grasp the very first time I tried to learn them. Recursion is the first one to come to mind because it took me so long to really understand and wrap my head around. And one of the only things that was able to really help me with this was taking the concept of recursion outside of the realm of coding and computer science and related to something that I was more familiar with. And for me, this was video games. Ever since, that has been my go-to when it's time to learn or become familiar with a topic and I'm just not seeming to get it. I like this method because it shows that difficult topics aren't so scary and really just require us to reframe how we're thinking and use a different lens. So today, we're going to embark on two main quests. The first one is going to be choose your own hook, where we are going to journey into state management and performance optimization techniques that can be done through built-in React hooks. So we're going to cover use state use reducer, use context, and use memo, memo, and use callback. And our second journey is going to be a little bit smaller, and we're going to explore dynamic content loading with React Lazy and Suspense. Today's content is going to be best suited towards engineers who are towards the beginning of their React journey, so you don't need to be a React expert in order to get something from this presentation. So let's get started with choose your hook. When you play a game like Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, it can be so easy to become overwhelmed with the amount of things that you can use as a weapon in the game. And that's because to some extent, you can kind of use anything to protect yourself. In the beginning areas, you'll probably take whatever weapons you can and try to fuse whatever you can. As you venture out to new areas and see new bosses, you're gonna have to be a little bit more strategic about what weapons you use. You don't wanna find yourself trying to battle something like Phoenix with just a branch. You might not get very far. While there's a ton of choices, most of the time there's no wrong answer, but there are better solutions to help solve your problems. In programming, the exact same thing is true. We're equipped with so many different resources as front-end engineers, and while there's usually multiple ways to accomplish the same end goal, some methods are typically better than others. Now let's talk about React hooks and some methods that can make or break the state management and performance of your app depending on how they're used. The first thing we're going to talk about today is one that I'm sure we have all used before to some extent, and that's use state. Use state is a hook for managing local state within a React component. It should be used when the state is simple, independent. What are some of use state's use cases? Honestly, because use state is a very basic hook, the use cases are endless. But here are a few common instances where you'll see use state in action. Simple form input handling, toggling UI elements like a modal, tracking user interactions, like a counter that keeps track of how many times a button was clicked. Now let's talk about what you see on the screen here. 
This on the left is a little social media app that I created for the demonstration purposes of this presentation, and it's called Hey Hyrule. Hey Hyrule is a social media app that has taken Hyrule by storm, and it has even captivated those who are typically of very few words like Link, and we can see this is his Hey Hyrule profile. So here we just have, of course, something you probably uh, have seen before, but it's like a bio and we have some posts, but here where we have a Triforce tap, um, this is basically like a liking system or almost like an app that used to allow us to poke our friends. And the thought is the more taps you have on your profile, the more popular you are. Now, we in this case don't necessarily want people to boost their popularity too much. So we allow them to Triforce tap their own profile one singular time and then they can't do it again. Let's talk about how we can use something like use state in order to create this Triforce tap component where we have tapped the button and then we have updated a counter. So let's talk about maintaining state. In our Triforce tap component here, we have two pieces of state. One is to keep track of the amount of Triforce taps a profile has, and the second is to determine whether the user is allowed to Triforce tap their own profile. And this uses a very simple use case of use state. In both instances, use state is going to accept the default value that we want to apply to our piece of state. And in return, what it's going to do is return the current state and also a function that we can use to update update the state when needed. And additionally, whenever we update the state with that function, it's going to cause a re-render within the component. So in this instance, what we have is a button with a single counter that increments each time the button is clicked. And then once we've clicked the button, the button is disabled. What happens if we want to make sure that the next state is calculated based on the previous state? What we can do is pass the function that we're using to set the state a function. What it's going to do is accept the pending state and then calculate our new state based on the previous state. This is super handy when you're performing multiple state updates in one event. Speaking of performing multiple state updates, what happens if we want to perform multiple state updates at the same time? We want to open up our functionality so that they can try force tap their own profile more than once, but we want there to be a cooldown period to make sure that they can't spam it. So as we can see, I have incremented the counter um, and this time it became available again after five seconds. How exactly would we update our code in order to make this happen? The first thing is we're going to need one more state variable to keep track of our cooldown. And that would make three different pieces of state for this one very small component. So to prevent that, what we can do is group these related pieces of state inside of an object so that they're all updated at the same time. This also is very handy because it's going to cause one re-render versus causing three independent re-renders. So with our new object set up, the next thing that we're going to need to do is update our handle tap function that's responsible for setting the state on the counter, whether we are allowed to tap the button and what our cooldown is. So the first thing that we want to happen whenever the button is clicked, we want to increment the amount of Triforce taps appears on a profile. The second thing that we want to do is set allow self tap to false while we go through that cooldown period. And then we also want to set our cooldown as well. Now with this alone um, in our handle tap function, we would actually find that our button would not become uh, active again and that's because we need one more piece. This is actually gonna be done through a timer within a use effect. It's going to count down and then update the cooldown within our state and then allow self tap when appropriate. Now this is a very small and common use case of using a counter. But when should you not use use state? You'll likely want to reach for a different hook or a different tool if you're trying to do something like global state management or if you're noticing that there are a lot of frequent re-renders within your component and it's starting to cause performance issues. And you should also potentially reach for a different tool if you're finding that you're reusing the same state logic within multiple components. Scope and complexity can really creep up on you. So as your state management and as your application in general starts to gain complexity, be sure to take inventory and explore other hooks or tools as you need them. Speaking of a hook that can handle more than use state can, let's talk about use reducer. So use reducer is a hook for managing more complex state. And it can be used when the state logic requires multiple variables, when the next state is dependent on the previous state, and when you want to manage state transitions in a more predictable manner. What are some of use reducers use cases? Well, I just mentioned state transitions, but let's talk a little bit about them. 
Use reducer allows us to predict state transitions with actions. An action describes the changes that we want to make to our state. It's usually an object with a type attribute, and it can also include additional data for the state change. So some examples that you might think about include form validation, shopping cart operations, and notification handling within apps. Outside of state transitions with actions, use reducer is also very handy for things like multi-step workflows and managing different component states like tabs and accordions. Think of different components that present differently depending on what state they're in. So let's talk about this section of Hey Hyrule that we have on our left. Hylians are travelers and they embark on so many different journeys. And the idea is it makes it easy for them to document these things as they complete them. So on this page, for instance, let's say we have picked up some bananas, <laughs> which is always a hard word for me to spell with all the A's and N's, and we wanna add it to our adventure log. A couple of things happen here. The first thing is we see that we have one item that we've added, but our log entries has also gone up. This is gonna keep track of the total of all of our items, enemies, and quests. And then down below, we also have a new log entry of what we collected. So let's say we defeat a Bokoblin, B-O-K-O, if I spelled that correctly. Um, we can see up here, now we have two log entries, one of each in the items and the enemies buckets. So while we could use something like use state in order to set this page up, it would be very tedious and there probably would be a lot of pieces of state. So let me show you how I used use reducer. So our first step of all is to configure use reducer. Use reducer accepts a reducer function that determines how the state gets updated. It accepts the initial state that we want to set for the component. And then optionally, if you want the initial state to be calculated based on a function or maybe something like an asynchronous call, you can pass it a function to calculate that initial state as well. Like use state, use reducer returns us the current state and also a dispatch function that we can then use to update the state when needed. Let's take a look at our reducer function. In our adventure log component, what we're doing is keeping track of all of our log entries and then breaking them all down by our three different item types. And we've set up our reducer function to be able to handle this. The first thing our reducer function accepts is a state and the action. And then it's going to return us our new state based on the different action types there are. Now let's take a look at our add log um, action first. What we're doing here is mainly setting two different pieces of state within uh, the reducer. We are setting log entry types, which is responsible for telling us how many of each of our different types. So how many items do we have? How many enemies do we have? And how many quests do we have? And then it's also going to log the amount of entries and the type of entries that we have as well. So in theory, when a new log is added, for instance, if we add something to our quests in this case, um, it's going to update the amount within this type and it's going to give us a one there because we're adding one to our quests. And then it's also going to add the entire log entry that would be displayed here at the bottom within our log entries. And then if we take a look at add item, add enemy and add quest, they're doing something that's all very similar. And what these are doing is updating the items, enemies and quests. It's updating the arrays of items within their respective categories. So once we have our reducer set up, it's ready to be used in different places around our component. And in our case, it's very simple. What we really have over here in our form is one button that's going to handle our submit. And within that submit, we have another switch statement that's going to determine what our log type is. And let's just go ahead and use add item because that's the one that I have been talking about the most. And what's going to happen is it is going to use this add item function that we have created. Um, An add item really is just using the dispatch function that we get from use reducer in order to update the state. So here in our add item where we can see that the type is add item. And if we go back up just a little bit inside of our reducer, we can see exactly how it's going to update the state. And the same is true for add log as well. And this payload is just going to be in terms of the items, enemies and quests. It's going to be whatever is in um, this box over here that we have submitted. And the payload for the log is going to include a little bit more because it's the entire entry and the statistics for the cards over here as well. 
well. So use reducer is a little bit more complex than use state, but it's really a middle of the road state management option, especially when you need to handle more complexity within a component than using something like use state, but you don't need the overhead of using something like use context. Speaking of use context, let's talk about it. What is use context? Use context is a hook for accessing context values within your React application. But what is context? Context in React allows you to pass a value through the component tree without having to define it at every single level. This can be referred to as prop drilling. It's designed to share data that can be considered global for a tree of React components. So when exactly would you want to use use context? As we just said, it's going to be any scenario where you need data to be accessed globally or through many different levels of components. So some scenarios might include sharing state across multiple components, managing global state, think about themes and authentication, global settings or configuration. And before we get too far, I just want to talk about a couple of key terms that are important to keep in the back of your mind when we're thinking about context. The first one is going to be provider. The provider component supplies the context value to all of the components within its subtree. And the consumer component or the use context hook allows you to access that context value. Something I'm sure we are all very familiar with, and I know some of us have very specific opinions on how we feel about it, is light mode and dark mode. Well, of course, Hey Hyrule had to have its own light mode and dark mode, and we can see it being toggled here. So fun fact about me, a very small tidbit, I code in dark mode only, like I can't code in light mode, I don't know why, but all of the apps I use on a regular basis are actually in light mode. What about you? So how would we go about setting this up? So let's talk about creating a simple light and dark mode for this page that we have here in Hey Hyrule. There are a few different steps, but don't worry because we're going to go through all of them together. Let's get started by creating our context. We're going to define our context type, which in this case, we are defining what our theme is going to be. And we are also going to expose a function to toggle the theme. We're going to determine what we want our default context to be. And then we're going to create the context itself. And something to remember here, it represents which context other components can read or provide. Now that we have our context, let's create the provider component. The next step is going to be to create a provider component that is going to wrap all of its children and pass that theme down. And in this case, we only have a light mode and a dark mode. So we're also going to expose a theme toggle uh, to go between light mode and dark mode from the child components. Now what we can do is create a hook to expose our context. Now I will say creating a custom hook isn't necessarily required, but it does provide us with a few benefits. It encapsulates the logic of accessing the context. This allows us to catch errors like the context being used outside of a provider early. And it also ensures that there is a consistent way of accessing the context throughout the app. If you choose not to use a custom hook to expose the context, and you can use the use context hook directly within the consuming component. So now we have our context, we have our provider, and we have a way to expose it, now it's time to wrap our application or our component tree that we would like to wrap within the provider. And then from different places within that tree that we have under the provider, what we can do is access the context in a few different ways. Like I said a couple of seconds ago, if you choose not to use the custom hook, you can do it this way. But if you're using uh, something like a custom hook like we created, you can access the theme and also the function to toggle the theme directly. And once you have a way to grab your theme, of course, you can develop a way. Now, this was a very simple use case for use state, but what are some more complex use cases for it? The first one is switching between multiple themes. In this case, we only had light mode and dark mode. But what if you had a theme store or like a lot of different themes that somebody could be able to choose from? Think about like Slack themes or Visual Studio Code themes. The next one is authentication and authorization. Think about logging in, logging out, but also think about handling multiple different user roles. If you're a super admin of an application, it's very likely that you have a lot more capability and the ability to see more pages and more components on a page than somebody who has something like a viewer or read only rights. 
The next one could be internationalization. Think about providing and managing different languages within your app and settings in order to be able to handle it. The next one is centralized error handling. Think of something like an error boundary. So when we take a look at use state, use reducer, and use context all together, we can clearly see that each has its own purpose and use cases. So let's review just a little bit. Use state is going to be best suited for that simple local state management because of its simplicity and ease of use. Use Reducer is going to be best suited for your more complex state management because of its structure and its predictability. And Use Context is going to be best suited for your global state management needs because of its access and elimination of prop drilling. Now, just for fun, and because this is a like fun video game theme talk after all, I decided to design each of these hooks a weapon from the Zelda games. So for Use State, I would say it's a branch. If you're in a bind and you're in a small space, it could be all you need to get you through, but it does break very, very easily. For user reducer, I feel like this would be a bow. And it's because you can be really strategic about how you use it. It's flexible and powerful, so you can do something like be strategic and fight something from a distance, or you can just run right into battle and it'll still be just as powerful. And for use context, I would say the Master Sword. It does have its limitations, but it is globally useful on all enemies. Now let's consider our state management side quest complete and move into our performance optimization hooks. The first one that we're gonna talk about is use memo. Use memo is a hook for caching the result of an expensive calculation in between re-renders. So what is memoization? Memoization is an optimization technique that speeds up calculations by storing the result of an expensive function call, and it returns that cached result that was already calculated when the same inputs occur again. And how does use memo implement memoization? So for use memo, it's going to memoize the result of a calculation, and it's only going to recompute when one of the dependencies within this dependency array here changes. What are some of the really good use cases for using use memo? Obviously optimizing performance. So think about heavy calculations like with arrays. Think about sorting or filtering a list. Without memoization, that function would have to run on every single render, even if the list hasn't changed. The larger the list is, the more performance issues this is gonna cause. So let's take a look on our left over here with what we have. So this could be considered a social media feed in our Hey Hyrule app, and it allows you to sort um, these posts by the most recent, by how popular the post is by likes, and by how many comments the post has. Now setting up and showing the benefits of use memo is a little bit tricky in a list that's so small. So what I would like to demonstrate here is a few different console logs so we can actually see what's being rendered and when. So let's hop inside our feed component. So our feed component is the component that renders all of the posts that we have here. And I've placed some console logs around our app. So the first one is inside of the feed components itself. The next one is whenever I click this force re-render button that is going to force a re-render to happen. And then there's another console log inside of our sorting function that determines how we want to see these posts. And in this instance right now, our get sorted posts function is going to determine how we want to see those posts show up in our feed. Now, without use memo, whenever we hit our force re-render button, we can see and expect a few different console logs. The first one is going to be an update when the button is clicked from the force re-render, basically just saying, hey, you click this button. The next one is going to be an update from the feed component because we have re-rendered the feed component to show all of the posts. And lastly, we expect a log inside of our get sorted post to tell us that it was run, but nothing has changed within our list from the time that we have determined how we want it to be sorted and clicking the force re-render button. So what if we add a use memo around our get sorted posts um, calculation? Using the same console log placement, we can expect something a little bit similar, but we should actually see one less console log. We should see one when we are forcing a re-render, we should see one to tell us that the feed component has been re-rendered, but we should no longer see that the get sorted post 
function is calculating how we want to see those posts within our feed. Now, in this very isolated instance, nobody's going to be just sitting around clicking a force re-render button, but in a real live React application, there could be a ton of different factors and different components, depending on how they are structured, that would cause your page to re-render. Now, let's talk about Use Memo's sister, which is Use Callback. Use Callback is a React hook for caching the function definition between re-renders. And it does this by returning a memoized callback. So like Use Memo, you can think about some of Use Callback's use cases as being anything where there are multiple versions of the same function on page. For this one, we can think about event handlers. Use callback is going to help us prevent a new instance of a function being created every single time the page is re-rendered. So let's take a look at our Hey Hyrule feed this time. On each of these different posts, now we have the option to like a post. And let's take a look at how that might be done. Now, without wrapping this function inside of a use callback, each one of these posts is gonna be re-rendered every single time one of these buttons is clicked to like a post, but why? So just like use memo, I've placed a few different console logs around uh, the feed component so we can see actually what's happening. What's happening is without a use callback here, handle like is recreated on every single re-render. This is causing all of our posts to re-render even if there's been no changes in our props or dependencies. So we can see here that when we are liking Impa's post, we are only liking one post at a time uh, where we are calling the like function. We are re-rendering the feed but also we are re-rendering all 10 of those posts and we don't want to do that. So this is actually going to be a two-fold optimization where we're doing two things. The first thing is going to be to wrap our handle likes function inside of the use callback, which is going to make sure that our function doesn't get recreated on every single re-render if nothing has changed. The second half of that is going to be to wrap our post component inside of memo. And Memo inside of React allows you to skip re-rendering when no props have changed within the component. So between Memo and Use Callback, we have cut down on a ton of unnecessary re-renders. So now when we click the like button on Impa's post, we can see that we're not re-rendering all 10 posts, we're just re-rendering Impa's post to let us know that it's been liked. Now, while this list isn't big, I know that you can imagine the scale difference of re-rendering one component on a page and re-rendering 10 components on a page. Now think of that at a very large scale where there are hundreds or even thousands of items within a list. This performance savings can be immense. So I have affectionately referred to use memo and use callback as sister hooks, where use memo is going to cache the result of a function uh, that's very expensive in calculation and use callback is going to cache the function itself to prevent unnecessary uh, re-renders and use callback is going to cache the function itself to prevent recreation uh, between re-renders. Optimizing with use memo and use callback is very beneficial when the use memo calculation is noticeably slow and the dependencies rarely change. Remember, computers are very fast, so if you're already seeing a delay visually, it's very likely that there could be some very big hiccups in performance in your code. And use memo and use callback are handy optimizations when they're being passed to a component that's wrapped in memo, almost like our post component was with our handle likes function, or when the value of use memo and use callback are being passed um, as the dependency of a hook. And I do just want to state that use memo and use callback are performance optimizations only. The React documentation talks about not preemptively um, solving performance issues, um, but I will say I have worked on both sides of the spectrum where I've worked on teams that prefer to go after use memo and use callback um, from the get-go. And then I've also worked on teams where it's not implemented until it's needed. How are we feeling? Are we ready to jump into our second quest? Our second quest is going to be a little bit shorter in scope, but still exciting nonetheless. It's going to be the journey into efficient content loading. So I don't know about y'all, but when Tears of the Kingdom first came out, I was so excited. I had to block off a whole weekend. Don't talk to me. Don't ask me if I want to have plans. I'm sitting down and I'm doing nothing but playing Zelda. And as I started playing, I found that I was easily overwhelmed by the sheer amount of things there were to do. 
I felt like every single time I was unlocking something or exploring something, there was yet more to unlock and explore. And code splitting works in a similar fashion. Let's talk about code splitting. So code splitting is an optimization technique that breaks down large bundles of code into smaller chunks. So instead of loading the entire application at one time, code splitting allows parts of the application to be loaded on demand only as they're needed. So this improves performance and decreases the initial load time. With code splitting, you can separate your code into different routes, components, or features. And then the chunks are loaded as the user navigates towards a specific route. So let's think about it like this. Both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom are big games. And while you can look out on the horizon and see different places, they don't get detailed and more textured until you start to get towards your destination. So let's consider our Hey Hyrule app that we have over here where we have our feed. With code splitting, what we can do is specify that we don't want our comments to load until a person has clicked on this comments button. And this process is called lazy loading. So how do we go about lazy loading components within React? In React, we can use lazy to enable code splitting at a component level. And what this is going to do is return us the component that we want to render. Now, when the component that we want to render is called to be displayed, but it's still loading, what's gonna happen is it's going to suspend. And when that component is being suspended, what we can do is define a fallback to show our users that there is something that's coming, but it's just not there yet. So let's take a look at our feed component where we are uh, loading our comments only when called. And what's happening is our component isn't ready yet. So we are using that suspense fallback to show that loading screen that we have there. This really helps to manage asynchronous component loading because I'm sure that you have been on a website before where something was definitely being loaded and it pushes the rest of the page down. And then you end up clicking on something that you didn't mean to click on. This gives the user a good indication that something is coming but isn't fully there yet. So what are some some good use cases for React Lazy and Suspense. The first one is going to be lazy loading very large components or components that are very rarely used. Only load them as you need them. The next one is going to be to load components based on route in something like a single page application. So in our Hey Hyrule app, let's say that we are not going to load our feed component or our profile component until the user navigates to those pages. Another one is delaying the load time of very heavy libraries. Some examples of libraries that might take a little bit longer to load are charting libraries and mapping libraries. And then of course, a great use case for both of these is to uh, reduce the initial load time of an application. Now there are some caveats. Suspense is only detecting when my component is being loaded, not when I have an API call that I am using to return the data that would show in these comments. The next is only suspense enabled data sources are going to activate the suspense component. So some of these include data fetching with suspense enabled frameworks like Next.js and Remix, loading components with lazy as I did here with my comment section, and reading the value of a promise with use. Now I know that last quest was super quick, but I hope that you still enjoyed it. And let's wrap up our quest that we did today with a quest summary. First, we embarked on a journey to learn more about performance optimization and state management with built-in React hooks. And we finished things off by learning about code splitting with React Lazy and Suspense. Ooh. So if you got to this point in the video, I just want to say thank you for bearing with me. Giving this talk another time, I see even more places I want to strengthen and update things. I would love to know what you all think in the comments, and I can't wait to put my next spin on this talk and give it again. So until next time, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for watching.